it's never going to be a successful birth case for me to give me a pregnancy without clinical healing. Uh, not without a profound change in the way we think in education. I really believe that. It's I believe I believe we're talking about generations. So, uh, but that's my my personal feeling because I've seen this now for decades as an academician. And we need questions. I'm going I'm going to hang for five more minutes. Oh, oh great! Oh, you're enjoying it. That's great. That's lovely. I'll tell you what. Let's get a go. Make sure everyone gets a seat. Here, the good news. I don't think we have to think about the next generations. It's about us. Uh, when I was born in 62, humanity, according to our assessment, used about half the regenerative capacity of the planet. When my son was born in 2001, it was about 20% more than Earth can regenerate. So we're starting to run a deficit at a global base. Using the most moderate projections of the United Nations, not the most aggressive ones, the most moderate ones, just, and then turning them into footprint accounts to say, what does that mean? By the time my son is my age, we'd be using about twice the capacity of the planet. And that's physically impossible, I believe. Sorry, the good news is that it's... It's about it's us. It's about us. We don't have to think about... I mean, the good, so, so we say, oh, we can't think about next generation. Think about yourself. Um, and, and, and so also, I think, incentives go beyond just finances. Uh, finance is an important incentive. But, for example, if you compare city structures, Siena in Italy uses about four times less resources per person than Houston. And that's not because of financial incentives. It's just the way the city is structured gives us a way of how, how to live. So there are many more intervention points than just finances to help us structure our systems in a way that we can live within the means of nature. But I think the f most fundamental insight we need to have is to understand from an in incentive system that investing in, our, in turning around the trends is not just good for the planet, it's good for ourselves. And I think that's what we haven't understood. City state, or st cities, for example, they spend millions of dollars trying to bring Silicon Valley to their own cities because they think that's the future, that's what, what it brings income. I would say investing in making your city more a Siena than a Houston is probably a much better return on investment that you can get. But I think that's what we haven't gotten yet. And that's why reports like what Pavan is pre uh, preparing with the TEAP report are so essential. I just love the idea of the Palio being run in, uh, in Houston. But anyway, that's a, that's, a great, uh, that's a great image. Pavan and then... I was struck when questions were being asked as to, you know, so what do we do? Is, is it about altruism? And, I, and uh, Mathis rightly points out, uh, we have less of a window to react, decide what it's about and do something. Um, I think fundamentally it's also about governments trying to remember what they're for. The purpose of a corporation is its own self-interest. The purpose of a market is to trade private assets. The purpose of the government is to look after public wealth as in your health, my health, my, our children's futures, our survivability. If governments forget what they're for, then I think we do have a serious problem. And I, I'm afraid we are at that point where governments have forgotten what they're for. They have become so beholden to the 60 or 70 percent of the economy which is in private hands, so beholden to the job creation opportunity that lie in, in the private world, and so beholden to the taxes that corporations pay, that they have completely forgotten that their duty and responsibility is not to corporations, but to us, to you and me, to all of us combined. And that cannot be. We, we have lost the one thing that is missing out here, the sort of that which fills the gap between the problem as we see it and the generation, which you rightly point out will take for the knowledge to happen. The one missing thing is called leadership. And leadership is about vision and guts. Just two things, nothing more. We need leaders who have vision and guts. Leadership and vision to understand the problems and anticipate them and guts to implement the solutions. You know, we do have some leaders, not very many. I'm certainly counting the U.S. president as, as a leader because he has vision and he demonstrates guts. And the U.S. president actually needs to be surrounded by a congress of leaders too. And maybe you're right, uh, Matis, now that it's not tomorrow's problem, so you can say whatever you want, but you're not going to be there anyway. But it's today, so if more people could... Uh, could recognize that and then ex exercise whatever leadership capacity they have. But let me just tell you, give you a couple of examples of what people are actually doing because it's not all hopeless. Some, there are some leaders out there who've recognized that something needs to be done, often at the local level. I just took a trip to visit some of our projects in the Middle East or West Asia and I, I looked at a, a watershed which 
people in the West Bank call a lake. It doesn't look anything like that, which wasn't so clean some years ago either. But it, and, and the problem with this lake, which really doesn't look like a lake to any of us, but there is water on the ground, is that every single farmer wants to have a dignified life and is taking water without organizing and talking to the neighbors, doing it illegally and, and in all kinds of ways. And so the water level is going down. So the local leaders have realized that we really have to talk to those people. Actually, maybe they're not so hopeless if they would understand what would be the benefit for them tomorrow and for their children the day after tomorrow or today, if you like. But it's no longer in some, some vague future. Um, so we've gotten together. It's a very tedious process in a way, but you've got to talk to these people, explain. If we collaborate, we probably will be able to regenerate the water level and, and, and all benefit from it. So it's, it, and we've been doing this with local communities and with the indigenous people's communities for quite a long time, and it's tedious, are you, talking. Are you, are you trying to help Abby Nevada develop financial incentives? Financial and a, and a dignified life, instead of their right to collapse, a right to live in a decent way to be able to have the water to farm and therefore sell your vegetables, yes. And, and, and they realize that maybe today they still have it, but by tomorrow they won't because they themselves see. Same thing, there is a river called the Zarka River. Most of you wouldn't think of it as a river that starts somewhere near Amman in Jordan. Apparently 20 years ago, people were actually swimming in that river only 20 years ago, That's, and fishing, of course. There is nothing, it's a trickle. It's less than what's in, in my little glass here. There too, everyone is taking the last drops for themselves. And, but unless they learn to work together and collaborate, they're just going to run out. The trickle is already gone. So again, again, leadership in having the courage to actually talk to the local farmers who maybe don't know how to read, didn't go to the big leadership schools, but actually have something to do with, with uh, making sure that they have a future. Just one question for Mati, so you didn't go far enough. What kind of life is your... So your, your son, by the time he gets to your age, is going to have, I don't, can't remember the percentage, a lot less, twice. But what kind of life, if we don't do anything, what's going, what kind of life is he going to have? What is this going to mean? Because you live in California. Yeah, I, I think people don't get so inspired by negative visions. So, but, but, but I mean, we, in, in, among us, I mean, what, what does it mean? We can already see collapses happen. They don't happen like a car crashes into a wall. They're I mean, more like the, the little trickles that get in, into smaller trickles. And then we see areas in the world that are already experiencing these kind of hardship. If you go to Haiti, for example, or Darfur, or uh, Somalia is in a different, difficult situation. And, I mean, so. I just want to say just one thing. I think you're absolutely right. We've got to stop the gloom and doom picture, and the negative visions don't help. Although I must say, I was in Central America talking to our members just a little while ago, and I couldn't help but ask them, you know, how can anybody sleep in this region by looking at Haiti? And there is an ethical issue here, too. Thank you very much. That's great. Do you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't mean to present a, a doom and gloom, If I, I hope, because quite frankly, uh, where I travel around the world and throughout the United States, to me, there is uh, perhaps the most remarkable perception of the problem at hand. They may not understand it as a system, but I think people, for the first time, are understanding it's not someone else's problem. And I think that is a really key step uh, to leverage. And if we don't leverage that, if we don't move very quickly on this, we'll lose that opportunity of this enhanced perception that we have. And uh, with that, uh, my apologies again to the audience and to the panel, but uh, I must leave. So. Thank you very much indeed. And, uh, safe trip. Thank you very much indeed. That's great. Well, look, at this point, let's throw things open to, to the floor. I'm sure you've all got uh, observations, questions you'd like to raise. Hand at the back. And there are mics, so please, yep. And then you. Yeah. 